Hi everyone and welcome to the Aerobic Assessment Lab. Uh, we'll get to cover how to measure and then program for uh, exercise in regards to the aerobic system. So first up we got to cover safety as always. Um, once we get a grasp of what to look for when you're conducting labs and, uh, sorry, when you're conducting aerobic assessments, we'll then move into looking a bit closer at what uh, aerobic energy is, where, it's, where it comes from, and how that plays into what you'll be seeing uh, when you conduct your aerobic tests. What we'll find is uh, your your respiratory uh, rate and depth uh, have a strong connection to both heart rate and the workload that uh, the person will be performing in this aerobic test. And last but not least, what do you do with that information? Once you have found your aerobic measures, how do you practically apply that? So as promised, safety precautions, these uh, is, is a bit of a short list of what you want to look for during aerobic assessments. So typically you want to be sure that you stop the aerobic test uh, or assessment if you notice angina, uh, angina type sy uh, symptoms. So, excuse me, so that's anything like tightness of the chest, uh, tingling uh, sensation in the arms, uh, maybe just chest pain and really you know if it, it uh, is similar to the signs of a, a heart attack or a light version of a heart attack you you want to stop the test immediately uh, similarly uh, to do with the heart specifically in the cardiovascular system since this is one of the key couple of the key systems that uh, an aerobic test measures is your heart your lungs blood uh, your vascular system uh, it, it kind of tests that that capacity if um, you have a overly dramatic uh, cardiovascular change so for example um, perhaps the your your uh, the participants heart beat increases exponentially uh, too dramatic uh, relative to the workload that's being applied or incrementally applied that's a good sign to stop if uh, blood pressure exponentially increases uh, that's a good good reason to stop uh, similarly if your vascular system or the participants uh, vascular system does something uh, counterintuitive like uh, it doesn't become uh, profuse, so it, it, you you shunt blood away from your your skin and working muscles, and um, that's uh, that's a good good time to, to stop the test. And uh, typically, what that looks like is the person's skin tone will change, so it'll go pale or or a lighter color um, than than what they previously were, and it'll happen quite dramatically. Uh, maybe their their lips have a blue hue to it. It's called cyanotic um, uh, coloring of the lips, or perhaps uh, you look at the person and and they look almost uh, green. They have a green hue to to their uh, skin tone, and that that would indicate uh, just general unwellness. Uh, and a lot of those are typically to do because of the cardiovascular system or, or changes there. Similarly, if you're increasing exercise and the, the participant doesn't have uh, any change in cardiovascular um, uh, response to exercise and increasing workload, then then that's an issue too. For example, like you're you're increasing the workload this person needs to do, yet their heart isn't increasing in in the heart rate, uh, blood pressure isn't slightly adapting and increasing either. All of these are indications that uh, something is going on with their cardiovascular system and should probably be stopped. Uh, if the 
test equipment. So what you're using, the the bike, the treadmill, whatever, um, all of a sudden it breaks or isn't functioning correctly, just immediately stop the tests, find a new piece of equipment or repair the one you're on, and then uh, reattempt the test. Uh, again, we kind of spoke about if they don't look good, you know, physically. Um, other things to watch for is if someone just suddenly stops speaking. So they're they're certain to do something and then just go really quiet. And if that's associated with a change of uh, how they look physically, then that's a good time to stop. A um, person could pass out. They could uh, uh, any number of things uh, be sick uh, or just feel very very unwell. Uh, and a good example of this would have been in in lab where a student had been starting a, a test uh, they, they started going uh, next thing you know they're just looking um, they s are kind of chatting smiling uh, they seem to be doing well and all of a sudden they just get this look of um, I don't want to say impending doom but very close to that and they just kind of almost look like they're they're hyperventilating relative to the workload they're supposed to be doing and again, just color drops from their face and they, they just slowly stop speaking. And it was at that moment where um, someone had rushed in and kind of scooped underneath the person's uh, um, armpits and, and kind of cradled their head and just helped them sit down essentially off of the machine because uh, shortly thereafter they, they'd almost uh, or had slightly passed out so definitely keep an eye on those things that can happen even with participants you wouldn't expect to have that happen so people that are otherwise generally healthy or looking well for any number of reasons anything from having uh, not eaten to uh, not knowing about a certain heart or cardiovascular defect um, until until that point so when you're doing your own um, uh, aerobic assessments, uh, again, be sure to keep on the lookout for those things. Now we'll, we'll take a, we'll kind of shift gears here and uh, go back to look at a bit more of the theoretical physiology or the, sorry, the physiology behind uh, the aerobic system and where the energy is coming from. And uh, so we're getting a bit more to the principal side. So if you recall metabolism as we went over, this this equation should be looking very, very familiar um, right about now. Um, going from food and the chemical bonds in food, breaking that down with oxygen, producing ATP, carbon dioxide, heat, um, water. So uh, what we're looking at really is that focus on, on oxygen being present and being used in metabolism. That's called aerobic metabolism. Similarly, if you think back to previous labs that we've done so far, anaerobic means no oxygen. So that, that uh, metabolism occurred without the presence of oxygen. Okay. So aerobic capacity uh, that's essentially measured by uh, your VO2 max. And what's VO2 max? Well, V stands for volume, O2 is oxygen, and max is maximum. So what is the maximum amount of volume of oxygen that someone can utilize and leverage to perform uh, metabolic work? And again, at the end of the day, it's, it's all about trying to produce ATP or energy that your muscles can use to, to perform work. Uh, and similarly, uh, just to tie in a concept here, VO2 max. So you can think back to, to the work rates or the ACSM metabolic equations where you came up with VO2 very often. VO2, so milliliters per kilogram per minute. So already again, when you hear per minute, you should think, ah, oh, that's a rate. Okay, so ultimately we're looking at the rate a volume of oxygen that a person can use for incremental exercise and that that's an important point as well we'll, we'll circle back to that or draw draw upon that later but again incrementally increasing this workload you can think of that yourself you know if you're starting to 
exercise lightly and then you increase your your exercise or your walking and then you walk up a hill that keeps getting steeper and steeper you start walking harder and harder and your your ventilation increases right so the amount of oxygen you're trying to use increases um, and, and so intuitively this this principle makes sense it's a rate how quick are you trying to use oxygen uh, for this part of metabolism to produce ATP Okay. And when you're talking about a maximum of that, it's, it's ultimately how fast can you get oxygen in your body to produce ATP for an incrementally increasing workload. Okay, so hopefully that ties those concepts together a bit. It gives you a bit better idea already right off the bat what a VO2 max is. And then last but not least, when we're looking at aerobic health in general and aerobic capacity and, and that side of things, you're ultimately trying to assess to one degree or another the cardiovascular system's health. Okay, how good does the heart, the lungs, the vasculature of our bodies, includes blood and the vessels, how good and efficient are they, it would be a better word, at getting oxygen fueling our bodies and allowing us to do uh, our daily activities, which are predominantly done in, in aerobic states, especially if we're uh, sitting around at laptops or computers and uh, hanging out on the couch or whatever. It's definitely in an aerobic state. Um, but also many sports need a quite high level of aerobic capacity. For example, uh, marathon or ultra running, long distance triathlons, uh, and cross country skiing in particular are, are usually uh, demanding of high, high level of aerobic capacity. And so your question to me now is probably, but how does this tie into what we've been looking at and know when it comes to the three energy systems that we've we've looked at. And again, you're right, so let's take a look at that. Here we have our phosphat uh, phosphagen system or ATPPC uh, system, your glycolytic or glycolysis, and here it calls it mitochondrial respiration. Uh, it's a good uh, differentiation to have made uh, however, knowing it just as aerobic respiration or aerobic metabolism or um, oxidate, uh, oxidative uh, uh, metabolism, is, uh, they're all, all interchangeable and, and any of that would be sufficient. But let's take a look at this graph and again you always want to step back and see what the heck is, is the graph trying to portray. So we're going to look here and we see ATP turnover kcals per kilogram per minute. So it's not milliliters like we're used to seeing with VO2, but it's talking about how much energy some, this can produce per body weight per minute. So already when, again, you see per minute, you know it's a rate. So how quickly can something do something? And then down here we have time. Okay, so uh, if we are talking and you think back to the pr previous labs you've done, that those maximal efforts you did, um, whether you're talking about the Wingate test, the Bosco repeated jump, the stair test, uh, all of them demand, uh, in particular the stair test and, and the first parts of all, all the anaerobic system tests, which is these two systems together, you know, you know that for the first, within the first 10 seconds, you get a lot of force production, you get a lot of energy. One of the reasons is you get you get a lot of ATP production or turnover within the first six seconds of an activity so six seconds that's the most ATP you can produce the most force within that time and and you've all had an opportunity to see and feel that uh, and then as you push on uh, you're getting towards 30 and even let's say 70, 70 uh, or 60, 75 seconds, um, somewhere in here, y you get all this remainder kind of ATP coming from the glycolytic system. So, but look at its rate, it's much lower. 
And again, you could probably feel and see that in the different tests being conducted for the anaerobic system. Start, start off really strong, but at a maximum effort out of the gate, it slowly, it, de it depletes quite quickly to the point where at 20 seconds, it, you know, on a Wingate test, you're wishing it was over. You feel like it should be over. And by 30, you, you really don't have a lot left uh, for, for most people. You don't feel like you have the same uh, push that you did, and, and certainly you don't, right? So that's our anaerobic system. But once we start stepping into about 60 seconds uh, on this graph, there's some variance and debate as to where this actually happens. Arguably, it also depends on how well a participant pushes themselves whether they push at a true maximum effort for the whole duration of the time it's quite hard to do as uh, as you've probably felt again as you've tried the anaerobic test but as we switch from anaerobic so no oxygen we start getting to a level or a rate of ATP production that is much lower but definitely sustainable for, for a much longer period of time. Okay. And you can see, just to validate, that somewhere around here, we have almost all three systems producing some sort of ATP. So again, this was a concept that kind of gave me an aha moment when, when I was going through this, uh, when I was first learning it in undergrad. And um, it's not a hard switch or turn off or on between each energy system, you know, they're each are producing um, its own amount, but again, at very differing degrees. And you can almost think of the aerobic system as as like a very uh, slow to get going system. Okay, but once it's going, it's like a um, like a diesel train in the sense that it can just run for a very very long time, uh, rather efficiently. So. Uh, yeah, again, you can see even in, in 10 seconds, you're already starting to get some contribution from oxidative uh, respiration or metabolism. Okay, that happens there. So, good. That was a great refresher of how everything fits into the three energy systems. But again, we're looking at the aerobic um, energy system. So, you know, you can already ask yourself, uh, you know, if you're looking at sports and trying to figure this out, you're like, why, why is it that all of a sudden um, I can't use like marath elite marathon runners run so fast, yet they're almost primarily all aerobic, and that has to do with their aerobic capacity. But ultimately, their their rate of turnover and efficiency and production and their VO2 allows them. To increase the amount, the total amount of ATP we get from that, but they they essentially um, don't utilize uh, anaerobic to any degree at all. So, so the question as we move forward here now is if we know we have these three components that add in to different respiratory uh, systems, in particular, no oxygen and oxygen. What does that look like? What does that look like as we incrementally increase work? Again, we understood here, all out work right away leaves us purely with uh, our anaerobic system, which depletes rather quickly, and then we're left with aerobic. But what happens if we start just incrementally slow and over time and, and uh, push ourselves up to, to our maximum level? We're gonna look at this each line kind of individually and then pull it all together. The the one main one we're gonna ignore for now is lactate, so you can immediately just don't worry about that. We'll come back to that in a review session uh, to help with concepts. But the first thing we're gonna start off with is trying to pair in in our minds what happens as we incrementally increase the work for for uh, for exercise, and one of the most in two intuitive things that happen, and we've all likely experienced this from uh, uh, any any type of physical activity we've done, is our heart rate will go up, and 
Uh, these two lines are oxygen and carbon dioxide production. So our breathing increases. So our, our carbon dioxide and, and oxygen increase as far as the ventilatory volume or rate that we do. And specifically, if you look here at the x-axis, it's inhaled oxygen and exhaled carbon dioxide. Remember, that same metabolic equation is coming up again. Air in plus food equals carbon dioxide out and energy and heat and water. Okay, so again, heat, heart rate goes up. Our breathing or our respiratory system goes up. Okay, but there's weird stuff that happens as we get to a certain point of effort. Okay, so as we start reaching our, our maximal amount of time and this says um, power or work workload power, as we start reaching that maximum rate, which will probably happen somewhere around in here, our heart rate actually starts plateauing out. See how that happens? It's linear here and then all of a sudden it curves and flattens and plateaus. Here our oxygen, the amount of oxygen we breathe in, gets up to a certain point and does something kind of similar, kind of flattens out a bit. But not quite to the same degree as heart rate. You see that? And then in a somewhat similar manner, carbon dioxide parallel in a linear fashion typically with oxygen until we reach our anaerobic threshold, which I'll come back to. But then we see the sharp inflection where we're breathing out more carbon dioxide than we're getting in in oxygen, but that also ends up plateauing a bit. Okay, and so if you think back to the purpose of the aerobic assessment, is in some way or fashion we're trying to figure out what our uh, VO2 max is. Okay, and so a lot of the the equations or or approaches that we we take in exercise physiology um, with the general population whether they're sedentary or not is to um, use a submaximal uh, assessment and so there's a few assumptions that come with that and we'll get to that in a second but one of them uh, one of the main ones is that uh, there's a linear relationship between heart rate and respiratory rate, okay? But only up till a certain point. So if we are able to measure how much work is being done over time, and we pair up, essentially, someone's heart rate relative to the workload, we should expect their respiratory rate to be linear under a certain amount. So if we only took this section in here, we only measured the heart rate within here and the uh, respiratory rate within here. We'd almost just say they're they're perfectly linear and they go all the way through. And that could be useful in a lab setting or, or gym setting in the sense that if you can measure heart rate, you'd be able to say what the respiratory rate is. And if you think back to the ACSM equations, you, you could uh, calculate your VO2, which is your work rate which you could figure this out, or any other combination of those. Okay, hypothetically, if you knew the work rate, you should be able to predict everything else. And again, similarly, and you'll do this with one of your, your assessments, is if this is linear, you know, an assumption can be made um, that based off of this relationship, even if you only know up to say this point, in theory, you should be able to just draw a straight line and correlate that to, to the measurements that you happen to have and be able to say with relative ease what your VO2 max is. Now, in reality, you can see where that might not be perfectly true up at a maximum effort. And so that is why typically there's error and quite a large error uh, with a VO2 max prediction, especially with very trained or undertrained individuals. Um, the reason for that is if you're to uh, perform submax uh, assessments, predict the VO2, those that are more trained know how to push themselves physiologically, mentally, in how to get to a true maximum or something that's relatively close.
So it'd be something here, right? And again, that's relatively a linear relationship right up to that point, right? Heart rate max again, get a little higher, but again, if you're gonna correlate the two, it's all gonna be relatively similar there. Okay, someone who's undertrained doesn't quite know how to push themselves all, all the way to there. So if you took their true VO2 max, they might fall a bit short. Okay, so there is inherent assumptions being made with your submaximal test relative to an actual VO2 max test. And they're really challenging, definitely. I uh, have done a few, so um, yeah. The other thing to take note of here, and we'll come back to it as, as promised, uh, is this anaerobic threshold. This is a real critical point, um, as well as something that's not marked here. So in one of your, your tests, looking for ventilatory threshold one and two, it's um, an ACE uh, kind of derived system or one that they utilize in their, their certification process. But essentially, they take what you now know, that heart rate and breathing rate is correlated and they say okay well and you'll really have to look here uh, but they do depict it somewhat there's actually a little inflection uh, uh, upward uh, inflection right here so it kind of goes straight and then just a little group creeps upward just a tiny bit before it hits the anaerobic threshold and then uh, again uh, the system is uh, overloaded uh, with carbon dioxide production and venting that, uh, whereas you reach a maximum amount of oxygen you can inhale. But right at this first inflection, that's what we call VT1, or ventilatory threshold one. And this is the threshold that's um, called a crossover point. And we'll come up to this a bit later. But again, you can see this is why with these, these uh, linear and, and close to parallel uh, although not perfectly, um, relationship between heart rate, respiratory rate, and increasing workload. Okay. So as I mentioned, uh, it's quite a bit, we spoke about the linear relationship, but other assumptions with a submaximal test are uh, something that I alluded to on the last chart was uh, that submaximal efforts can predict effectively maximal efforts. And if you recall the point about elite or um, highly trained individuals versus uh, let's say sedentary or non-trained individuals, you're gonna have variance between what they can actually get to on, on those um, maximal effort tests relative to what they're predicted to get, typically. And last but not least, when you're doing the submaximal tests, one of the uh, one of the uh, assumptions is within a three-ish minute interval or state after you've incrementally increased a workload, the assumption is that you can reach what's called a steady state. So your physiological state has met equilibrium. And what I mean by that, we'll just hop back for a second here, is that as this workload increases that your body will meet that workload say through their your heart rate and it will stay at that workload as long as or it'll stay at that heart rate as long as the workload doesn't change and so you end up meeting this kind of equilibrium where as long as you work this hard your heart rate is only going to be here at a steady rate if the the workload is at a steady state okay but again, if you increase the workload, heart rate increases. All right, so that's that's an assumption it makes. And those are really important, again, when you go to, to make these uh, predictions as I already spoke about, okay? Sorry, I went back. Um, so knowing that, again, as I mentioned before with the ACE, uh, the ACE, uh, a test for a ventilatory threshold and how they have that set up in their CERT program. You can look at something like this. So as we increase exercise intensity, and this is just uh, higher and lower denominations there on the uh, uh, on that axis, 
And this line here, the red one, minute ventilation is the exact same as these, uh, these two together, okay? So the exact same as this. So this is ventilatory rate, let's say, between carbon dioxide and oxygen. That's the ventilatory rate here. And again, please note the first inflection, very, very subtle. Second inflection, a little bit more uh, pronounced, okay? The reason you get this, and you're going to need to to be aware of this for when you do your your own lab activity, is um, as you're building up your workload and you're starting to increase that ventilation rate, your heart rate's coming up. You get to a point where the volume, your tidal volume, so that's the the amount of your breath in and breath out increases. So as I Breathe in, breathe out, that increases, okay? In particular, as we head towards ventilatory threshold one. So this is the cusp of your aerobic zone. Once you get across that, you, you start leaving the aerobic and start entering your, your anaerobic or the backlog of systems, okay? What do I mean by backlog? Let's back up for a sec. So again, once we reach a certain point, right respiratory rate starts increasing and you notice there's a little departure of carbon dioxide the other thing that happens here is lactate starts building up so recall lactate isn't necessarily a bad thing but it's definitely an indication of an increase of hydrogen protons in the cell and that increased acidity or change of ph um, lowering of ph so going um, is starting to occur and when that's starting to occur, there's a backup or a backlog of the energy systems. So the demand, the work, is becoming too great for purely an aerobic system to handle. Okay? Might be a little tricky to wrap your head around, but we'll try to use an example here uh, when we move forward again. Okay? So as I'm work as I'm walking. Okay, let's go back to walking up a hill. As I'm walking along, I start the hill gets steeper and steeper, so my exercise intensity increases up to the point where, you know, I'm starting to breathe a little heavier, but I'm not breathing faster, okay? This is the normal rate I'd be breathing at. I'm just getting more exchange of gases. That's it, uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide. And that serves me well till about VT1. And at VT1, again, that's the point where systems start to backlog. So if I had um, a jar here, the, the lactic acid or the acidity of the cell would start to get us such that we'd start seeing a little bit of an uptick there. Again, so we're leaving the aerobic system, entering anaerobic this early on. And so when you do this activity on your own, it's it happens much quicker than a lot of people anticipate um, most people when they start thinking that they're working hard or working in an anaerobic state think they have to get all the way up to the uh, ventilatory threshold too and when you get to that moment you're like <sighs> like watch the 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 video that i uploaded uh regarding uh this test you know, the the uh, woman on the bike they're they're working really hard like you can see she's really breathing uh, quite, quite heavily and at a rapid rate, okay? And that's the difference between VT1 and VT2. VT1, you can hear someone breathing in deeper than you typically would if they're just at rest, and that's okay. But it'll get to a point where that interferes with their speaking. You notice if I start um, needing to breathe in a little deeper that interrupts my speech okay so again that reaches a tipping point where you exit the aerobic system and enter the uh, mixed system and then purely anaerobic okay i'm going to say that again so this is a mixed component anaerobic and aerobic and this is a anaerobic system up here okay and as soon as someone starts breathing rapidly so they increase the amount of breathing they do that's that's heading into vt2 okay why is this important 
we'll get to how to apply it for training. But it gives us a really cool indication, a really good trick at figuring out what fuels are being used. Okay. So let's get ourselves situated here. We'll take a look. We got fuel utilization, percentage of from rest up to higher intensity exercise, fat utilization, carbohydrate utilization, and this thing at VT1 called a crossover point. Okay, so before we dive back into this, I want you to think back to the resting metabolism lab and try to think about uh, your RER for a second. So um, remember that exchange ratio, the respiratory exchange ratio, RER. The thing that that indicated to us was, again, if there was more carbon dioxide being produced, that meant there is more uh, uh, kind of like work or more more activity or more metabolism occurring at a higher higher exchange rate, which meant uh, carbohydrates were being utilized. Remember, when we were really at rest, we should have had, we should have mostly had fat utilization, unless someone had eaten some carbs recently. Okay. So keeping that in mind, now let's look at this. So at rest, what do we find? mostly fat utilization. Actually, even into low activity, it kind of peaks up a bit. We start increasing the amount of fat that we use. Great. So what does that mean? We need to use less carbs, carbs, fine. But there comes this point where we start working hard enough at a, at a moderate intensity. And again, this is only at VT1, and you'll see how early that occurs. We hit, hit a crossover point, okay? So our carbohydrate utilization starts increasing and our fat utilization goes down. Now some people call this um, the most metabolically equivalent spot is that this, this crossover point where um, even though the percentage of what you're using here, uh, fat goes down, the rate at which it's producing energy is some of the highest at the crossover point. You need car a good amount of carbohydrates to burn um, fat through oxidative metabolism, okay? So again, VT1, one of the things we can do when we test for this is we can figure out exactly at what point, and again, so what ventilation paired with that heart rate, can we figure out where this is occurring? And then we can design programs that are going to, again, be quote unquote fat burning versus ones that will dip into the carbohydrate storage and, and leverage that. Okay. And so that kind of looks something like this. So we figure out, and oh, we'll have to skip back, sorry. So as you can see here, if we look at where this anaero the aerobic threshold, sorry, is, that lines up to a certain heart rate. And this is what you do for your, your assessment is you look at where is that heart rate or where, where do I notice the change in, in respiratory depth to the point where the person is interrupted in their, in their speech enough to hit VT1. And I go, okay, well that occurred at this heart rate. So knowing this heart rate, I can very easily say this is the point where everything below was utilizing fat primarily for energy production and anything above is using carbohydrates. And indeed, especially past VT2, that's purely carbs. You know, so you have a hard, hard switch there, okay? And this is the blended between the two. So what does that look like on this one? Sorry, um, here, VT1, VT2. So I know, again, if I was to pair up a heart rate to this and there, this is all fat utilization mostly, sorry, this is a blend, a bit more an even mix between the two, although carbs are still predominantly being used, and then this is a lot of carbohydrates here, okay? So trying to pull in another concept here, why is it when we use tons of carbs and our work intensity is very high that we need a greater breathing rate. Why would we have to breathe a lot heavier at this point? 
So this is VT2, somewhere in here, okay? So VT2, look at what happens with your carbon dioxide. Peaks way up, it's not linear anymore, right? Remember that backlogging of systems I'm talking, uh, mentioned earlier? Big peak up. So what do you have to do if you have tons of carbon dioxide is starting to build up in your body because you're working hard? Well, that's because anaerobic metabolism has kicked in to try to help fuel all this, this work that your body's having trouble maintaining in an aerobic state. So it's like, we can't handle, your body's like, I, I can't handle this anymore for your, your energy demands. You know, you're demanding energy at this level, this level, this level. I can try, but I'm going to have to use the turbo boost. And the turbo bo boost adds, which is your anaerobic system, this turbo boost adds in extra um, carbon dioxide. Okay. And how do you know that? Think back to your RER. What meant, what ratio between carbon dioxide and oxygen meant um, carbs was being used one or greater than one right so the amount of carbon dioxide met or was greater than the volume of oxygen when was it fat well and again if there was was actually measured versus just drawn uh, o, vo2 actually starts sorry make sure you can see this vo2 actually starts here and again kind of dips down and then crosses back over top and the crossover up to this point where it exceeds one, okay? And so why is that relevant? Again, if you think back to your RER equation tables that you've seen, 0 0.7 is, which is at rest, which isn't, I guess could be here, is predominantly fat up until about 0.85, which then you get into the blended, which then goes up. So you can see how all of this now, with all your previous knowledge and, and looking at this aerobic system and how it ties into your anaerobic, it, it all really starts pulling together from everything from fuel use, okay? So now let's go back here, <laughs> coming back to actually programming. So if you figure out where your VT1 is, let's say it's 122 beats per minute. So if you minus 10 beats per minute, you get your zone one and you know this is a really good fat burning zone okay this is where you're likely to be maximizing the rate and the amount uh, sorry the yeah the rate at which you're you're burning fat okay what happens at vt1 to energy consumption again it moves to a blended right so you're going to have a mix although carbohydrate predominating between carbohydrates and, and fats in zone two. Okay, there is a zone three. Okay, that's the upper zone of this. And so that would be another 10 beats per minute on top of this. Okay, so 20 beats. And that that's when you start getting to your anaerobic system. That's when you start getting into almost, uh, well, predominantly uh, carbohydrate use. And, and uh, you can't sustain efforts typically too too long up there because this is very close or sh should be at your anaerobic threshold and that's when again your metabolites really start backing up here kind of slow enough but you can typically keep on top of producing enough ATP through your aerobic system that the backlog doesn't um, unless you're going for uh, two plus hours or an hour 90 minutes plus it really doesn't um, start getting taxed too much uh, in it and I should specify in a trained individual about 90 minutes in zone two okay um, yeah and so if you get someone who's sedentary they're just uh, off the couch and wanting to start training with you you take them through the talk test so you find out where their VT1 is and at that point you you really um, you kind of dial in what this zone is and you get them to train in zone one predominantly. You know, once they get a good base of, of exercise here, they can definitely handle this um, because it's it's within their uh, within a reasonable heart rate zone. 
Um, then you start getting them to do intervals. So one minute in zone one, one minute zone two, and, and um, you slowly start building up some zone two to the point where they can, um, they can do some zone two work. You know, maybe in 12 to 16 weeks or something, you do a retest, and you get them up into zone two. You can do some steady state intervals over the aerobic threshold. And then once they get quite strong, typically you do, um, you can do a steady state around this threshold, which um, you can do over unders uh, or just right around or just below that threshold um, to build up your aerobic capacity. And you can also add in, or say you have an athlete walk in uh, who's quite, quite, has a quite strong aerobic system, they, they can go from zone one to zone three intervals. And you essentially want to spend about 10, depending on their goals, uh, about 10% of the time in, uh, of total training time in zone three. Uh, again, depending on uh, if it's like an intermediate person, you're talking again about 10, 15% of the time in zone two, and then the rest of the time actually in zone one. And you can put quite a bit of volume into zone one because it doesn't tax the body. So bringing it all together here in the end, I, I find this so fascinating, the aerobic system and aerobic tests. I think they illuminate so much, both uh, from general cardiovascular health, so your heart, lungs, blood, vasculature system, to sports per performance. So um, 10K racing, 5K racing, uh, cycle fondos, marathons, ultra marathons, endurance events uh, of all kinds. Um, uh, even even fun stuff like uh, bathlon uh, ski and shoot, right? So uh, it's it's really cool to to take a peek into those sports uh, with this, uh, as well as uh, determining your ventilatory threshold one, so the aerobic BT two. So now you're understanding your aerobic system too, and where that starts kicking in, and then your upper level of of health and performance when you look at your VO two max, what the rate is there. So I hope you enjoy doing your labs. Uh, I will certainly enjoy seeing them and I uh, hope that this aerobic system has provided a great platform for you to start tying in all of the concepts that you've learned uh, up to this point well, uh, and tying it all together. All right, take care.